Welcome back to Mini Torch. In today's lecture, we're going to cover some basics of mini machine learning. Just a reminder from last class, we're working through our definition of a machine learning model, which we've defined as a parameterized function m. It's a parameterized function because it takes an input just like a standard function, but also a set of parameters theta. Remember that in last lecture, we defined parameters using the module system, which gave us a declarative tree, which represented all the parameters in a model. Practically, we implemented these by overriding the module class in Python and defining parameters and submodules. Together, this formed a module tree where every one of the parameters that we were working with had a clear and well-defined name. In today's class, we're going to go into the details about how a model actually works and what these parameters actually do. We'll end the class by defining a loss function, which will be the focus of our next several lectures. To begin with, let's define what we mean by a data set and the basic setup for doing machine learning. The input x to our model will be a very simple data representation. To start with, we are going to work with two-dimensional data points x. x is made up of two values, x1 and x2, so we can represent it as a point in two-dimensional space. We're going to be given many different data point x, and these all will just be different points in this grid. In addition to individual points, we will also have a ground truth label y. We'll be doing binary classification, which means y will represent one of two classes, either red or blue. By convention, I'll say the red points are positive and the blue points are negative. One point of confusion for new learners here is that y does not represent the y-axis. Both up, down, left, and right are properties of the input x. y represents the color. We start with a whole training data set that corresponds to a bunch of these data points. Each data point has its location in space X as well as its true label Y. We're going to be working with these very simple data sets to start with. However, in future lectures, we'll get to more complex data points X. For instance, later in the class, we'll classify images these correspond to more complex inputs. For instance, it might be a point with 700 different dimensions. These points also will have different classes. Here we have a point with class two, and the set, set may represent many of these instances, each one with a class Y. Here we're trying to classify the difference between the number two and the number eight when written in practice. Given a single data point, we'd like to classify what its label should be. So in particular, this is the guess of the value y. We'll do this by using our parameterized function m, and this function can be basically anything that returns a scalar value. As I mentioned earlier, we'll use the convention that returning a positive value corresponds to predicting the red class and a negative value corresponds to predicting the blue class. So let's look at some example models. For instance, one model is to simply make a decision about which class we think a point is based on a hard rule. So this model here has a function which we'll call forward that simply decides to return the value zero or one based on a single feature of the input data. So let's say we have a point x that corresponds to 0 0.5, 0 0.2, and we're passing it into this model. The model will simply look at the first value, decide if it's less than 0 0.5, if so, assign it to a blue class, and if not, assign it to a red class. We'll use the convention throughout that models are represented by a class with a member function forward that determines the label. We can also use models that contain their own parameters. For the convention in this lecture, I'll use a Python data class to represent the parameters. However, you could also think about this as using a full-on Minitorch module. 
This particular linear model contains three parameters, W1, W2, and B. These are stored on the self variable within the forward function. So when we want to compute our output, we are going to multiply self.w1 times x1, the first feature of our data point, plus self.w2 times x2, the second feature. We'll then add in the parameter self.b. This will return a scalar float value, which will represent our classification of the underlying point. Before we talk about this model in more specific details, I want to draw a picture that represents the output of the model. Specifically, what this shows is the points that we could have fed into the model that would have led to a red or a blue classification of the underlying data. We didn't actually have specific values for the parameter, but what I want to show you is one possible output that would have corresponded to one setting of W1, W2, and B. Next, let's look at a slightly more complex example. This model, which we'll call split, is defined as having two submodules, M1 and M2. Both of these are instances of linear, which means they both have three parameters on their own. Together, this split model has six different parameters that it can use to make its decision. If we look at the forward method, we can see that this parameterized function is calling in to both self.m1 and self.m2 and then multiplying the results. This corresponds to making a decision that's based on two linear sub-decisions. In practice, this can lead to a decision graph like the one on the bottom of this slide, where we split up the space into blue and non-continuous red portions. We'll discuss these sort of models later in the class, but for now I just want to emphasize that where the red and blue parts of this graph are, are dependent on the definition of the model function. To emphasize this point, Let's look at one more model, which we'll call PART. PART is a rule-based model. It's going to divide up the decision space based on arbitrary rules. So in particular, we'll form a square by deciding what is red and what is blue based on looking for an x1 between 0 and 0 0.5 and an x2 between 0 and 0 0.6. This corresponds to a graph with a red square on the bottom left and the rest of the space classified to be blue. Next, let's look at what these parameters actually do in terms of controlling some of these models. I'd like you to think of parameters as little knobs that you can turn to control the decision space. Any information that's going to control basically the shape of this graph is controlled by these parameters. The main machine learning challenge is going to consist of the following problem. Here we assume we have gold data, which consists of the circles and x's on this graph. We would like to change our parameters such that we better put the x's onto the red side of the graph and the, the circles on the blue side. To do this, we'll change theta, our parameter. If our model is a linear model, there are two particular ways we can change the parameters. The first thing we can do is to change the weight of the underlying model. These weight parameters are the first two arguments to linear, W1 and W2. If we change these parameters, it consists of rotating the separator line. So for instance, we can go to a line equally dividing the space to one that's more curved, favoring the up and down direction as opposed to the left to right direction. The second thing we can do is to change the separator cutoff. We do this by changing the bias of the underlying model. So here we move the bias from negative 1 to negative 1.5, and we can see that we've transposed the red cutoff of the underlying data. This corresponds to simply making more of the space blue and less of it red in practice. 
Mathematically, the model that we are implementing consists of the following m function. We take in x as our main argument and have parameters w and b. We calculate the value as x1 times w1 plus x2 times w2 plus b. This is the function that we've been implementing in our forward class so far. So far we've defined what a model is and can be. However, we haven't connected the fact that we're given training data for a task and want to produce a model that is good for that training data. To do that, we'll need to consider the question of what makes a good model. We've seen that we are able to split up our space into red and blue sections. These correspond to the model making a decision about future points. However, given this decision, we also need to think about how good the model was at classifying the points we were given. In some sense, this comes down to deciding whether one model is better or worse than another. For instance, in this diagram here, the model on the right is clearly doing worse than the model on the left. Many of the training points are on the wrong side of the line. But how can we turn this into an actual value that we can use in practice? To do this, we'll consider what M is actually telling us. When we take in a point X and make a prediction M, the final value is telling us both whether we got the point correctly classified and also how far we were from the underlying decision we wanted to make. So in particular, in this example here, the blue points are classified as positive, and they're classified as positive by a relatively wide margin. We would like to take this into account when assessing that the model did a poor job. To simplify things, let's consider an example where we have a blue point, and we have three different models. We would like to assess how good each of these models are at classifying this blue circle. We can see here that both in the first and second model, the point is correctly classified, although in the second model, it's closer to the decision boundary. In the third model, the point is clearly on the wrong side. We would like our loss to weight our incorrect points and utilize this distance as part of the function. In particular, we're going to define a function L that takes w1, w2, and b into consideration in order to determine the loss as a function of these parameters. The simplest loss function is ReLU. We implemented this in your class module 0. The way the function looks is that if a value is less than 0, it returns 0. And if it's greater than 0, it returns the value itself. This is a basic function, but it can be used as a way to determine a loss that rewards correct points and punishes incorrect. So in particular, if we take the three models that we saw on the previous slide, we end up with this single point ending up in three different locations. For two of the different models, it was on the right side of the decision boundary. And on the final one, it was on the wrong side. So for the first two points, we have a zero loss. And for the third one, we have a loss that is proportional to how far away it was from the correct answer. On your homework, you'll be using a slightly more complex loss based on the log sigmoid function. But for now, I think this intuition is the important part to get started. The other thing to remember is that when classifying points that had a different gold truth label, such as points that we wanted on the red side, we have to actually flip the ReLU function as well. This corresponds to a ReLU in the other direction that corresponds to where we'd like the red points to be. In practice, we implement this full loss with the following function. We iterate over all of the points in our training data, and we compute the loss corresponding to negating the output of the M model. By doing this, we are able to produce a loss for each one of the individual points and sum them up to the full loss of our target value. Sounds like a good place to end for today. Remember, as always, you can ask questions on YouTube or Twitter.
And uh, next class, we'll get into some of the more interesting parts of PyTorch, including starting the foundations of auto differentiation. See you next time.